Dear students, in the previous two videos I showed you how to calculate the performance limits of an aircraft. Now these limits provide the combinations of altitude and airspeed at which an aircraft can fly from a performance point of view. So this is what the aircraft is able to do based on the propulsion system characteristics, the aerodynamic performance and the aircraft weight. However, this does not necessarily mean that the aircraft is allowed to fly in all these conditions indicated here. There are some other operational factors which also need to be taken into account. Now I will address the operational limits of an aircraft in this video. If these are combined with the performance limits, then we know in what conditions the aircraft can fly, but is also allowed to fly. Now there are three operational limits I would like to address. First is the design diving speed, second the maximum Mach number and third the structural limit of a pressurized cabin. Now let's start with the design diving speed. During flight, gusts and turbulence can be encountered. Based on statistics of the atmosphere, it was determined by the airworthiness authorities that the structural design of an aircraft must be able to cope with a positive or negative gust of 25 feet per second. If an aircraft suddenly encounters such a gust, then the angle of attack will change immediately. It is as if you would drive with a car over a speed bump. With a car, of course, it is better to drive slowly over speed bumps and the same holds for aircraft encountering a gust. So what does this mean for the structural loads inside the airframe? For that I'm going to make a small derivation. Now, structural loads, we can express them with the load factor. And the load factor is by definition the lift of an aircraft divided by the weight. So this is what we call load factor and we express it in G's. Now in cruise flight, when lift is equal to weight, this will be equal to 1 for cruise. So cruise means 1 G, which means you're experiencing inside the aircraft uh, normal gravity. But now we've just seen that we're creating additional lift on the aircraft, so we will get a change delta N in the load factor, which will equal the change in lift suddenly by the gust divided oh, by the aircraft weight. So delta lift can be written along the normal equation for uh, lift, which makes it the change in lift coefficient times a half rho and the airspeed we have now is v squared plus a gust u squared. So I will just make again this small picture. We have an aircraft flying at velocity v. We are encountering a gust of magnitude u, which means that the change in angle of attack can be represented with this small diagram. Total velocity is the square root of u squared plus v squared and this would be the change in angle of attack. So the change in angle of attack can then also be written as the tangents of u divided by the airspeed. So this means that delta CL, we can express that if we have a look at the relationship between lift coefficient and angle of attack. Typically speaking, it looks like a straight line up to the stall angle of attack and then it starts to drop. But in the region for normal flight, this angle I indicate here is actually the change of lift coefficient with angle of attack. <coughs> so we know 
what delta alpha is. It's tangens u over v. So the change in Cl will be equal to d Cl d alpha times delta alpha. And if we insert that in the equation, we get for delta Cl d Cl d alpha times delta alpha, which is the tangens of u divided by v times a half rho v squared plus u squared times the wing surface area, of course, which I was forgotten over here as well. Now, in practice, we are considering a maximum airspeed. Okay, so in practice, u will always be quite a lot smaller than v. So this also means we can approximate the tangents of u divided by v as u over v, since it's a small angle. Furthermore, we can state that v squared plus u squared is about the same as v squared, because v is much larger than u. Now these two assumptions make our equation for the additional lift much simpler. So the additional lift will then be dCl d alpha times u over v, so I remove the tangents, times a half rho v squared, so I removed u squared, times s. And since I have a v over here and a square over there, we can remove the v. Now, if I would write not delta lift, but delta load factor, so what the airframe is going to experience, we will find that this is dCl, the alpha times u times v times half rho s divided by w. So I've introduced this w here. Now, in practice, an airframe is structurally designed to withstand a certain load factor. So this delta n is actually a constant value, a maximum load factor. In addition, this dCl, the alpha term representing the aerodynamics, is always more or less constant. U is a constant term which we found from statistics. V is the flight speed we are interested in. Of course, a half and rho are constant if we're looking at a specific altitude we're flying at. And if we're considering a specific aircraft weight, then these terms are also constant. So, in practice, if we assume a certain maximum additional load factor for which the airframe is designed, we can state that the airspeed must be below this delta n maximum times 2 over rho times weight divided by s times 1 over u times dCl d alpha. And you can see clearly here that we have one term here, which is air density, which of course changes if we fly at a higher altitude, but all the other terms are 
constant if we assume a specific aircraft weight. So if I would draw this airspeed limit, then it would look something like this. So at increasing altitude, air density indicated here becomes smaller. So that means that the airspeed we can fly at can be a little bit higher. So this is our final result. One boundary, an airspeed which the aircraft is not allowed to exceed in order to limit the structural loads on the airframe. So concluding, the airframe is designed for a specific load factor. Typically this is four times the gravitational acceleration. Uh, this is a typical number for commercial aircraft. Now this limit load factor determines in combination with the aircraft weight, wing surface area, aerodynamic lift curve and the maximum speed at which the aircraft is able to withstand a positive or negative gust of 25 feet per second. Now this limit is what we call the design diving speed. The design diving speed increases with increasing altitude. And this speed limit should of course never be exceeded. And in order to be on the safe side, a small safety margin has been defined by the regulatory bodies with respect to the design dive speed. And this limit is called the maximum operating speed. Now this is the first operational limit. Let's also have a look at the other operational limits, starting with the maximum Mach number. Now the lift drag polar we have used so far was either a one term or a two term polar with the factors k being constant. However, what I did not yet tell you is that these factors k actually gradually change when the Mach number is increased. At some point, when the speed of sound is approached, the aerodynamic behavior can change quite drastically. Even at subsonic speeds, the airflow can locally become supersonic. And this can be explained with a schematic representation of an airfoil and its streamlines. Now the flow accelerates along the cord of the airfoil. So even though the aircraft is flying subsonic, locally the flow may accelerate to a supersonic level, creating a supersonic region of air. The Mach number at which one point on the airfoil reaches Mach 1 is called the critical Mach number. Now supersonic flow is associated with shock waves and it may significantly shift the aerodynamic center. Now it is not my intention to explain these effects in a great amount of detail. That would be the topic of an advanced lecture on aerodynamics. The only thing we need to take from these observations is that two things can happen at Mach numbers approaching Mach 1. Shock waves start to appear on the aircraft, which can result in undesirable buffeting or vibrations, and a shift in the aerodynamic center can cause a severe pitch moment on the aircraft. Furthermore, aerodynamics control surface may become less effective or even ineffective. Now due to these effects, it is quite dangerous to fly at high Mach numbers with an aircraft that is not specifically designed for it. Therefore, commercial aircraft typically have a maximum Mach number at which they are allowed to fly. If we would draw the maximum Mach number in the speed versus altitude diagram, it looks more or less like this. Now since Mach number is a function of temperature, the corresponding airspeed decreases with a constant Mach number will result in a decreasing speed limit with increasing altitude. Now beyond 11 km altitude, temperature remains constant in the international standard atmosphere, and thus the speed limit associated to the maximum Mach number as well. Again, in order to be on the safe side, a small safety margin has been defined by the regulatory bodies with respect to the design maximum Mach number. Now this limit is called the maximum operating Mach number. Now let's have a look at the final operational limit, the limit associated to a pressurized cabin. Now commercial aircraft typically fly at about 10 km altitude. In order to create a nice environment in the aircraft for the passengers, the cabin is pressurized. And the difference between the internal pressure 
and the external pressure on the aircraft creates stresses in the fuselage structure. So the st fuselage structure is designed for a maximum pressure differ differential. So this means there is a maximum flight altitude at which the aircraft is allowed to fly before the pressure differential becomes too large. Now this limit can also be drawn in the velocity altitude diagram. It is simply a straight horizontal line indicating the maximum flight altitude. So, now I have addressed all three operational limits. The maximum operating speed, the maximum Mach number and the maximum flight altitude. Now let's combine all these limits in one diagram. Uh, you should note that these limits are fixed. The performance limits, however, can exceed or lie within these boundaries. Furthermore, the performance limits also depend on the weight. Now this complete picture gives us the altitude and airspeed to which the aircraft is constrained for a specific aircraft weight. We call this the flight envelope. And this is our final result. A very important figure for an aircraft operator. Next time I will briefly address how the pilot will deal with all these varying, varying limits using his or her flight instruments.